Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the uh, first such a lecture in our, uh, from our center, Sadhguru Center for Conscious Planet. For those of you who don't know what the center is about, it's basically a multidisciplinary center integrating uh, various disciplines from neurosciences to yoga and meditation and trying to learn from each other, essentially combining uh, science and spirituality. Uh, it presents virtual lectures and discussions highlighting the research and explorations um, of our multiple uh, faculty members from this community of scientists, global experts, and thought leaders. Uh, we are fortunate to have Mayur Mudigonda, PhD, a research affiliate of Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet. He has a doctorate in theoretical neuroscience and artificial intelligence from UC Berkeley. His research interests lie at the intersection of perception, computation, and action. And uh, it's a very interesting topic. I'm really looking forward to see what he has to talk about here. And currently his research interests are focused on the intersection of cognition and meditation. A parallel thread of his work includes applying AI to problems in climate science. When he's not doing research, he loves meditating, playing guitar, and spending time outdoors. Mayur, take it away. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Mayur, uh, and uh, I uh, graduated from UC Berkeley in 2019. I got a PhD in vision science, uh, but the lab I spent most of my time um, uh, was called the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. And uh, it's an incredible place uh, just to learn about all things about the brain and just thinking about uh, how does the brain do computation. Um, so I spent, I spent some time thinking about how to convey the excitement that I have for perception and computation without necessarily uh, inundating folks with the, uh, you know, the minutia of the math or uh, other, other uh, physiological details of, of, of cells or neur neuronal circuits. So the way I've tried to structure this talk is, is largely uh, uh, pedagogical, trying to communicate uh, high level concepts on perception and cognition. Uh, and and what what fascinates me and why I, why I find biology endlessly fascinating, uh, but there there is um, uh, and, and I promised Bala and Sabrina there will be very little math. So the, but but I I did want to introduce one concept, and then there are a couple of uh, results uh, springing out from that idea in in different fashions and forms, and you will see that being applicable in problems in uh, uh, life sciences as well. Um, so. Uh, the way I'm hoping this talk will go is like, uh, feel free to stop me at any point that you find something interesting and we can talk about it. Uh, we don't have to necessarily um, go through the entire talk as such, but uh, otherwise we should be able to finish on time and I'll, 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 I'll hang in there after and then we can have some conversations on things that interest you or excite you. Yeah. Uh, okay, with that, uh, what is the problem of perception? And uh, this is a this is an important and uh, interesting question because, uh, in my understanding, and and I would say uh, this is a this is somewhat accepted, uh, the problem of perception is is trying to make a cohesive representation of the world from multiple inputs that are mostly sparse. And the, the importance of sparsity will come up in different themes across the talk. But uh, I want you to recognize that if you can take away from this talk that, you know, that you don't really see what you think you're seeing, um, that would be cool because then you go out and look at the world in a very different way. Um, so uh, what, what do I mean by that, right? Uh, so the problem of perception, uh, you, can, you can take it as a, a so here are four uh, different um, examples. The one on the top left, uh, which is denoted as A, is a canoe parked uh, against a tree and, uh, and lying flat on the ground. Um, now you can see it's a canoe, and I'm assuming most of us on this call can see this, but if Mayur, you look at it as- Mayur, sorry, we're not seeing anything other than your slide, your uh, title slide. Oh, really? Okay, uh, thank you. Let me fix this.
Is this better? Yeah, I, uh, I see your title. Okay, great. Yeah. It's okay now? Yes. Uh, just wanted to make sure that one more, one more time, sorry. Uh, hopefully you can see this. Yeah, the problem. Uh, is yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, uh, <clears throat> on the top left, you're seeing you're, what you're seeing is a is a canoe uh, that's parked against a tree and and lying flat on the ground. Uh, and what you're seeing below is essentially a um, if you were if you were taking the pixels and you were making a, an, a, a histogram of the intensities, that's what you see. So in some some way that is really what your inputs are to the system and 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 you can see that it does not look anything like a canoe when you're looking at it uh, as this histogram of intensities uh, and and that's that's really the challenge right that's what you're trying to use as inputs and you're trying to perceive this canoe and in in a way that uh, in a nutshell that conveys the problem of what perception is that's what you're really getting a garbled input and sometimes even less than that and you're trying to make sense of this cohesive view of the world uh, there are other important things. Uh, if you look at uh, B, it's the same face, but as you move it around in three-dimensional uh, world, what you're seeing as a projection onto a two-dimensional plane uh, gives you a very different perspective, and, and that can look very different to uh, 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 a user or, 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 a, or a person looking at it. Uh, in C, what you're seeing is it's the same surface uh, on the left and the right panel, but you're seeing different lighting, and that creates a very different percent of what you're actually uh, experiencing. And in D, you can have uh, the, the, the contrary, which is that you're, uh, there are two different surfaces where one is actually painted and the other is actually maybe a natural you know, metallic substance. Uh, and so all of these can give you either a very similar or very dissimilar percepts, even though the inputs are somewhat um, um, misleading in some sense. Yeah. Uh, and so th this, uh, there's a really beautiful uh, set of work that has evolved from this uh, called Bayesian cognition. And we'll talk about this idea of Bayesian uh, representations or Bayes theorem a little bit more uh, into the talk. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this. If you have not, uh, just uh, this is a, it's a really, very simple experiment. Uh, when you look at this particular cube, um, some of us would see uh, A uh, being the vertex closest to you. And some of us might see B as the vertex closest to you. And if you and, and many of us should be able to switch between A and B um, fairly easily. It might take a little bit of staring at it. But uh, the important thing is like you won't see both A and B. Once you see the percepts, you're usually switching between the two. You're not uh, ever uh, caught in a way where you're seeing this as not a, a cube. And, and this this idea is called uh, you know a bistable percept, and 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 this exists. Uh, there, there are many theories on why this exists. Uh, some of it, including um, that inherently are uh, the the representations we have learned are coded for three dimensional worlds, uh, and 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 consequently, there's an entire subfield of visual. Uh, cognition, which is uh, called psychophysics, where people uh, do interesting things like this, right? Uh, these are called Penrose triangles, uh, which were popularized uh, by Raja Penrose, uh, who's, who's a phenomenal mathematician. And if you can look at the one on the left, it, 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 it's just endlessly fascinating, right? This, this sphere is just going to keep going on, and it'll it'll uh, it'll baffle uh, the your your percept of like how you expect a sphere to go on something like this. And on the right is a similar kind of example. You see like what you think is a triangle, it's really not a triangle. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it, I, I find this fascinating and I'm hoping that you, you find this somewhat fascinating at least. Um, so what, what, why are these important? Is like these are not necessarily hacks or artifacts of the visual system. It's more that uh, your system has evolved to do certain types of functions in the world and when they are tested with things that are maybe less likely or less plausible in the world, then you end up with these sort of uh, um, solutions that where where the visual system resorts to something that's simple, uh, and and then you end up seeing a percept or an illusion. And this is what visual uh, illusions are about. Another very important aspect of illusions, or or sorry, perception, is is the role of perspective. 
uh, and and I, I, I want to play a small video and, and hopefully you guys have a good uh, sound system to listen to it. It's just be a few minutes, but I, uh, it's pretty entertaining. What we've done with some of our force perspective shots is be able to move the camera for the first time. That they were always techniques that required the camera to be locked off because once you started to move the camera, it would give away the illusion of one person being further away when you're really wanting them to look like they're side by side. In order to get the camera alive, we started thinking about ways of uh, using motion control in order to doing you know, what we call moving force perspective shots using uh, slave motion control bases. You do a motion control move where you have the, the one actor on a moving platform. So when the camera moves, you're doing your moves all relative. So you're literally sliding the guy along on the floor as your as your motion control move is, is motion control camera is moving along. You have the camera on a motion control dolly, making it move in and out or side to side. But you have another smaller dolly that's electronically hooked to it and does the exact same motion, but sort of in a counter movement. But every time you move one way on one dolly, the other one immediately responds. When you're actually viewing it, you're, you're basically doing a split. And if you're doing a move around, when you do this split, it looks like they're moving in sync with each other. And it's because you're moving the two guys around relative to this, this moving camera. In, in the shot where Frodo is pouring tea for Gandalf at a table, and the camera kind of crabs past from one side of the table to the other side. And in that instance, Ian McKellen was actually sitting on a dolly that was actually moving him slightly on a small scale table with small scale props. And it was not too far from a full size table, a Frodo size table with larger Frodo size props. I've got a, a look uh, there. When he's standing? Yeah, but I don't, and I've got a look there for when Light is sitting. What I don't have is a look when he's crouching, which is the beginning of the shot. Okay, well we, we can give you that. We can go back to number ones and make sure that you've got that. Through camera, at one end of the move, everything lines up. When you move to the other end of the track, everything still lines up because that smaller table and Ian McKellen on that other dolly has moved slightly. It's kind of fun to actually build these things uh, and, and see them in camera. You know, it's, I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, it's fun to actually just, you know, get dailies back and the shots done. It worked pretty seamlessly, and everyone was really amazed with the result. In the fires of Mount Doom, taken by Isildur from the hand of... Uh, so, so hopefully that was, that was kind of fun. Uh, I, it's one of my uh, more favorite movies or themes to read about. Uh, and, and I just really liked uh, how important perspective is. Uh, both in life, but also in, in in the fact that you are able to see things because of perspective. And I say perspective here; it, it actually is a, is an entire type of geometry that people use in in, in vision uh, to help you see things uh, in in a three dimensional world. Uh, and so uh, there are a lot of things that you can do in in playing around perception, uh, which is affected by uh, pers the perspective. Um, but we've talked about things where there isn't any uh, requirement for the agent or for biology to interact with the world. But that's, that's really not, uh, uh, the, in, 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 in my opinion, and also uh, that's held by a lot of uh, scientists, uh, that's not in of itself complete, right? We are, not, we are not agents sitting in a world with no need or room to interact. Uh, so it's really important to uh, understand uh, how we go about interacting in the world. And, and this is not just restricted to mammals or humans, uh, and this is, uh, this is across the board. So I want to show you a couple of examples, one on uh, jumping spiders, which are, uh, they're incredibly fascinating creatures. Some of the uh, jumping spiders are about uh, the size of a pinhead, uh, and they have uh, maybe like about 35,000 neurons, and some of the uh, ac you know, actions you see them perform are just amazingly sophisticated. Uh, the other other reason why we like jumping spiders is uh, they actually possess uh, the machinery to do three-dimensional vision. So you can see them actually uh, uh, track, hunt, uh, move across uh, large 3D rooms and um, uh, do very sophisticated behavior, which is uh, fascinating that you, you can see such sophisticated behavior in such a small animal. And with uh, box jellyfish, which will be the one after, uh, they actually have 24 pairs of eyes and actually can see 360 degrees. Uh, and, and, and they don't really have a cortex per se, but you can still see them 
performing some very incredible actions. Um, so uh, hopefully what this can inspire you is to, is to maybe think about like, what is really the role of the cortex and what is, uh, uh, what, what seems to be endemic uh, across all of biology. Okay, uh, these are videos, so uh, feel free to sit back and enjoy and turn up your volume if you don't have it already on. But spiders themselves have their own unique talents when it comes to hunting strategy. These brightly colored jumping spiders have brains the size of pinheads, yet they're among the most successful hunters in the animal kingdom. They can jump as much as 80 times their own body length and still judge their landing with pinpoint accuracy. It's this deadly aim that gives them the edge. Praying mantis is a formidable challenge, but the spider is not deterred. Mantis and spider confront each other. The mantis rocks to and fro, hoping to confuse. It doesn't work. The frontal attack is only one of the jumping spider's many strategies. Others are more subtle. Here, the Porsche jumping spider mounts an attack on an almost blind but venomous cross spider. First, it tries to lure the cross spider within range of its deadly sting by shaking the web, mimicking the thrashings of a trapped insect. But the cross spider isn't fooled. Sensing danger, it bounces the web and stays put. So the jumping spider tries another approach, this time taking advantage of the cross spider's poor vision. Quietly, it climbs up to a point just above the cross spider's web and very gently lowers itself to within striking distance of the unsuspecting prey. The jumping spider's surprise attack has struck home. Now all it has to do is to wait for the poison to work. The jumping spider's repertoire is unusually varied. And it's not limited to ingenious hunting behavior. Some have evolved physical changes to help them secure their prey. They've perfected the arts of disguise and camouflage. Cool. Uh, and, and the next one is on um, box jellyfish. Uh, box jellyfish are just incredibly fascinating creatures. Uh, and so hopefully you can uh, appreciate them a little better uh, after this short video. Any exposed skin is vulnerable, and he's going in barehanded. Beautiful animal. Yeah, it sort of sounds a little dangerous, but as long as you get hold of the right end of the animal, just like working with snakes, get the wrong end, you're in trouble. Careful not to brush up against its deadly tentacles. Jamie uses a specially designed surgical glue to attach a small transmitter to the underside of the jellyfish. What I'm really interested in is trying to work out where and what they do for a living. So what I'm trying to do is able to predict when they turn up and when they disappear. And if we can do that, that makes the beaches a heck of a lot safer. Almost immediately, the tracking signal begins to move. The tag is working, and already it begins to reveal the secrets of the box jellyfish. It isn't just drifting aimlessly, it's swimming. 
and fast at speeds faster than most Olympic swimmers. And seemingly, it's swimming with intent. The tagged jellyfish is headed straight towards shore, past a beach full of people, and heads into the mangrove trees in the shallows at the far end of the beach. But why come here? This forest of roots is treacherous for a creature dragging eight feet of tentacles. It could easily get entangled here. But these mangroves are the spawning ground for countless fish, the box jelly's prey. And somehow, the jellies are successfully navigating this labyrinth and hunting. But how is this possible? How can an animal with no brain not only negotiate this perilous world, but also actively hunt down prey. In his lab, Jamie is setting up an experiment to see exactly how box jellies navigate. He begins by placing white PVC pipes in the middle of the jelly's tank. Blindly, the jellies crash into them. These guys have actually run into this white pole and knocked it over. I mean, it's, they obviously can't see the white. But Jamie changes the color. This time, black poles. Dark, like the roots in the mangrove forest. If you remove those white poles out and put black poles in, the animals go from what appears to be this random movement to almost this movement of going, okay, we're just gonna avoid these black shapes. And so they'll swim in and out of the tubes. No longer random, they actually seem to be physically avoiding them. You look at that, I mean, that animal made a distinctive movement away from back pole. It seems that these jellies might actually be able to see and dodge obstacles in their path. But the experiment is not yet over. Jamie has one more trick up his sleeve. Red poles. The results are remarkable. What was really interesting is when we put these red tubes in, yet the animals no longer did these figure eights through the tanks. They seemed to spend all their time as far away from these poles as possible. There is little doubt that these animals can pick up things in the water. I mean, they're seeing the poles and they're actively making decisions as to whether or not they're going to go around it or whether they're going to avoid it they seem to be able to pick out the differences between certain sorts of colors. Exactly why these animals react to color so dramatically, science has so far been unable to answer. But it does seem clear that box jellies have visual abilities. Cool. Uh, so so uh, that, that was, that was uh, sort of one of my favorite uh, animals in, in the animal kingdom. Uh, if, if you... Uh, feel like this talk is uh, heavily biased towards vision, well, I, I am a bit of a vision chauvinist, uh, but uh, you, you will see a, a similar pattern, for example, in, um, in, in fruit bats, uh, they, they can do some uh, very, very elaborate uh, three-dimensional uh, navigation uh, and, uh, and, and, and also locomoting just using uh, sound. Um, more specifically, you know, uh, emitting high frequency sounds and then creating creating a map of the world then, and then navigating. And you you see similar behavior in say mice, which have uh, some um, they have vision, but they rely extensively on tactile sensing. And I and I worked a little bit uh, on creating cohesive representations on uh, sensory and motor uh, uh, cortices in, in mice. Uh, and it, it's really 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 impressive what they can do and how much they can use their whiskers in different ways. Uh, to explore the three-dimensional world. Uh, but, you know, this is not restricted only to uh, uh, animals. I, I, I will focus the rest of the talk largely on human perception. Uh, but is that a role for action? And is, is, is our perception something that's plastic? Uh, which, or is it, is, and, and how much is, does learning contribute and how much of it is uh, just developmental and how much of it uh, can be changed? Uh, later on, and and I wanted to just uh, put another plug to something that 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 really just like blew my blew my mind when I when I first learned about this uh, as a PhD student, um, and and this work was uh, essentially uh, by some folks uh, in in the 50s and 60s uh, by Kohler and Taylor, 
Uh, here you're seeing a few examples. Uh, what what the, these are called inverted prism experiments. So essentially, uh, the 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 person on the left is uh, is wearing uh, glasses that have flipped the world upside down, uh, and I think it's the same thing on 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 the right as well. Uh, and and it, they have some really unique uh, uh, stories or answers that they have uh, that we shared about. In 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 one, uh, so uh, Kohler was the first one who did this, and and so what he reported was that in a, after about a few days, people initially it's like complete uh, completely disruptive, like you're you know you're not able to perform any activity at all, and after a few days you're able to like uh, reach some level of uh, functional ability. And after about a few weeks, which is about two, 14, two weeks and, and close to about 18 days, uh, they're able to get near normal perception uh, and uh, uh, be able to function in the world. But there's still some very strange things that tend to happen. For example, um, when they hear, uh, so, so in about 18 days, they're able to like see traffic uh, persist the same way that, you know, if you hear a sound, you and you see, uh, you're standing by the street, then you, you assume that the, the car is coming from your right and you're able to function uh, effectively. But uh, if you look at the numbers on a uh, uh, on your car, like your uh, your license plate, uh, all the all the writing is uh, apparently mirror writing. And uh, very early on, the, the 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 brain like flips to some very strong uh, percepts. For example. When you light a candle, it, it just assumes a, uh, the flame has to go up. Uh, and if you, if you put coffee in a cup, you just assume it goes down. Uh, so there's some strong notion of uh, physics somehow encoded into the world, which, which is uh, extremely fascinating to me because if you're trying to build robots, one of the things that you want to understand is uh, how much of the physics of the world do, do, does, does biology need to uh, learn or uh, versus they can be encoded uh, somewhat explicitly into the system. And th this can make like uh, enormous differences in building really sophisticated machinery. Uh, okay, so so enough about uh, uh, you know. Uh, hopefully, this 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 motivates you that this is a great problem to think about, and you can spend like you know uh, a lot of time thinking about this, uh, uh, and it would be time worth spending. Uh, but how does the brain go about encoding all of this? So let's let's uh, think about it from from um, a little bit of a a vision perspective uh, and how, what is the basis? When you say basis, like what are the building blocks for, with which you can actually uh, build a representation? Uh, so the, for vision, it tends to be things like illumination, reflectance, shape. Uh, and, and, and these are, these are fundamental building, building blocks to, to create a, a representation of an image. Uh, I haven't included color, but you can include color. You can include other spectrums. Uh, I, I, uh, I, 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 there, 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 that's an entirely, uh, it's a full talk in of itself just discussing color. So I'll, I'll stay away from that for today. Uh, I, what I want to do next is just give you like a sort of a brief whirlwind tour of how uh, theory uh, or computational models work. Um, and, and, and I promise there's, this won't be like too mathy. Uh, there might be a little bit of math, but uh, we can gloss over anything. Uh, I, I can't see your faces, so I can't see how bored you are, but hopefully it's not too, it's not too terrible. Um, so, so, some of the earliest work um, in, in theory uh, evolved from an accidental uh, neuroscience experiment uh, by, by, by Huben Wiesel and, and they won, 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 won massive awards for this work just uh, because it, it completely shaped how we think about uh, uh, you know, the brain and the cortex. Uh, so this experiment was, a, you know, there, was a, there was an anesthetized cat uh, with, uh, and there was, a, you know, there was actually a, a electrode into the uh, visual cortex or V1 and uh, somebody accidentally uh, moved a bar of light across the visual field of this cat. And then they heard a brr on, on the, on the uh, uh, recording unit. And, and then uh, they were like, hey, hang on, that's, that's, that's interesting. What's, what's going on there? And then they essentially went about trying different orientations of, these, uh, of this uh, bar of light. And then they found that the, the, that particular neuron uh, from which they were recording from was very sensitive to a specific orientation of light. Uh, and that means there's dark, light, dark, right? And so that's what you're looking at. And, and from that evolved an entire uh, understanding that there are cells that are very, very, very uh, tuned to orientation selectivity. Uh, so some cells care about a, a bar of light exactly at 45 degrees in, in this particular way, some care about it this way. And then you have complex cells, which are actually 
uh, uh, care about not only is is it uh, you know this particular orientation is it like it's uh, it's movement driven so it has to be that uh, you know light is coming you know darkness light and uh, darkness is going in this particular order so you have this notion of simple and complex cells so then people start building theories um, so one, one of the most uh, prominent and, and, and incredible scientist is David Marr, who, who unfortunately passed away very young, but he, he propounded this whole theory of uh, vision and also AI uh, and computational models. Uh, so this is a, a, a essentially a, a Laplacian or Gaussian model, which is essentially saying, you're looking at where the high frequency up, uh, gradients are in, in an input scene. And, and then, and that's what, that's what uh, uh, the cells in, in V1 care about the most. And, and so they built a model, and, and, and this is a very famous model in computer vision. You can, you'll, you'll find this in almost uh, a lot of papers in the 80s. Uh, this was great, and this explained a lot of the uh, functioning of the early uh, visual cortex, but uh, a lot of it uh, still somewhat uh, left desiring. Um, and so uh, many, many more models came up uh, since then. Uh, they they uh, tackle different aspects of how computation happens in the brain. So one, for example, is efficient coding. Uh, and, and, and you'll see this even now, and it's actually a very, very powerful concept uh, with uh, uh, deriving heavily from an entire branch of math and physics called information theory. Uh, so efficient coding is just saying like, uh, uh, you can say like, uh, you know, maybe there are 10 people in Bala's lab. How do you efficiently uh, split up the work so that you're uh, optimally able to like, uh, break a problem down. That's what efficient coding is all about. Um, so one way to think about efficient coding is like everyone does, uh, you know, 10% uh, of the work, uh, whatever it is, if there are 10 people and then you get the job done. But then that means everyone is working 10% of the time, 10% of their day all the time. And so this means you don't have a weekend off, right? So uh, the other way to think about it is like, no, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it that uh, some people do specific types of things. And so now when those specific types of things, and you're, you're able to like look at the larger piece of work that you need to do and break down what those specific kinds of things are in such a way that nobody's working too much, but everyone gets time off. So that's, that's the uh, essential idea of efficient coding. Another very important uh, concept, which is endemic is, is, uh, is unsupervised learning or the idea that, um, that biological systems just learn with a lot, a lot, of, lot of data a lot of samples without necessarily a, a teacher signal coming in and telling you what is actually uh, to be done or what you have to learn. Uh, another important, uh, uh, super important idea is Bayesian inference. And we'll talk about this a little bit, uh, which uh, what's, what's really powerful about Bayesian inference is that uh, it, it relies on the idea that you uh, have prior knowledge from either experts or from, from teachers or from other systems that you can use very effectively to model uh, specific things and, and, and explain things in the world. And, and so this is, this is a very powerful idea for uh, a lot of biology and a lot of sciences as well. Uh, and we'll talk about it in a moment with an example. Dynamics is also like really important. Uh, learning how to uh, understand, because nothing in the world is static uh, and, and biological systems work uh, have their own inherent dynamics at different time scales and different uh, uh, spatial complexities. And so learning to leverage that uh, has been a whole body of work in, 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 in theoretical neuroscience. Uh, and, and a very important concept is predictions. Uh, the, the inherent, um, you know, uh, there are all these theories on curiosity, humor, and everything else uh, that rely on the fact that you get your, your biggest bang for buck when you're making a prediction and 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 your predict and, and the reality is different from the prediction that you make. Uh, so so there's a there's an inherent component of uh, biological systems that's trying to predict the difference between the current scene, uh, or current state of the world, and what what it expects to see. Uh, and then and, and since you're sampling the world so fast, you're able to like uh, build a model that's just a, a difference between where you are and what you what 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 you think has changed. And and I, I if that sounds. Um, too confusing, that's fine. Uh, all of these are like super fun things to talk about. They're full, full fledged stocks in of themselves. Uh, and there's a lot of really beautiful, elegant math in each of this, uh, which we won't go into today, okay? But it's important to talk about probabilities. Uh, so I thought I'll do a, a small experiment that shouldn't take more than like two minutes. Uh, so I have a coin here with me. And uh, what I want to understand is like how, uh, you know, what is the probability of uh, heads, which I think this is, uh, 
maybe Jefferson. And then uh, on the back is just like the, uh, I think it's a map. So I'm just going to toss this five times and I'm going to try to figure out, uh, you know, the property of a heads. Uh, so that was a heads. Um, heads again. Heads again. Tails. And heads. So I got four heads and one tails, right? Uh, so if I asked you, what is the probability of um, heads? Uh, how many of you would agree that it is uh, four fifths? Um, I, I feel like maybe this might be a nice time to use the show of hands. You can use your up arrow button. Uh, would, would you say four fifths is actually, uh, I, I, I haven't forged this coin in my own personal mint. This is, this is a regular US mint coin. So, uh, and, and we, we have this notion that this is a fair coin. So, uh, but, but, but my own experiment right now, which uh, you can trust me that I did this somewhat fair, uh, uh, said the probability of heads is four fifths. Uh, but uh, I'm, I think it would be fair to say that that's not, that's not really uh, capturing the essence of what, what uh, uh, this coin is supposed to be doing. So, so what, what is that? That, that notion of like um, something that you know uh, a priori to the problem is what you're trying to capture. Uh, and, and, and that's what ba Bayesian cognition does for you. So it's not 0.5 because uh, it's, a, it's a very simple, right? If I toss this a million times, it'll get closer to 0.5. Uh, if I toss this uh, a billion times, it'll almost be 0.5. And if you go really, really, really large, then you will in the limit conditions get to 0.5. But in a lot of real world applications, you can't do that. But what you can do is you know something a priori uh, to this particular problem. So that's really what the Bayes theorem uh, talks about. Uh, it essentially tells you that, uh, um, so, so don't worry too much about the math or, or, or this like fancy looking uh, things. Uh, all, all you're looking at is like, there's a probability of a hypothesis. And then there's a the probability of, uh, given that hypothesis, uh, this particular data that you're seeing. And, uh, and what this means is that your prior knowledge about um, uh, a problem can help you uh, better estimate uh, this coin toss. Uh, so you, since we can assume uh, coin tosses are somewhat fair, then, then the probability of heads and tails is equally likely. You would set them as 0.5. And if you use that information, you will get a number closer to that, even with a few samples. So let's walk through an example. So this becomes a little bit more useful. And I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping most of this is familiar to you, then we can just skip through it. Uh, otherwise, uh, um, you know, this is, this is fun to learn and I think it'll be useful in many things that you're experiencing in your world. Uh, so here's, here's an example on allergies. Hunter uh, says she's itchy. Uh, there's a test for an allergy to cats, uh, but the test is not always right, right? Uh, for people that really do have the allergy, the test says yes, 80% of the time. For people that do not have the allergy, the test says yes, 10% of the time. So it's like a false, uh, true positive and false positive. 1% uh, of the population, uh, you know, uh, actually have the allergy and, uh, and Hunter tests, uh, yes. So what is the chance that Hunter really has the allergy? And this is important, yeah? Uh, I, I, I don't have allergies to cats, but, you know, it's, it's an important thing. I have many friends who actually have this problem. Uh, so what you want to first compute is what is the probability of allergy given that uh, the test says yes. Uh, so uh, the, the formula is, is written the way about. Uh, we know uh, uh, from, from the previous problem description, the probability of the allergy is like 1% uh, and the probability of uh, people saying yes uh, or testing yes uh, um, uh, is, is about 80%, right? So what we don't know is what is the probability of uh, yes. That is, you need to compute both uh, both both cases of the hypothesis. If you go back to our earlier thing, there's a summation at the bottom of the uh, in the denominator, which is telling us that over all possible hypotheses, how likely is this current hypothesis? That is what you're trying to uh, evaluate with with the Bayes theorem. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, so we just compute this, right? Uh, so we know one percent have the allergy, uh, and the test says yes to eighty percent of them. 99% do not have the allergy and the test says yes to 10% of them. So we plug in those now values uh, and essentially we compute uh, in the first line what that means. So it's 1% times 80% uh, plus 99% times 10% uh, that gives you like 10.7%, uh, which, uh, which essentially says 10.7% of the population will get a yes result. Um, and now, so we can plug that into like our answer before, which is like 1% of the population actually tests yes. 
uh, and, and the actual answer uh, is, is about 7%. So this is somewhat useful to think about uh, because it's telling you that using prior knowledge or prior information can be extremely powerful uh, to explain um, things in the world with very few examples. And, and, and while you might think this, this, is, this is a thing about allergies or something like that, uh, this, this applies like endemically to lots and lots of problems in, 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 in computation and in machine learning and AI. Um, so, and, and, and definitely so in perception as well, right? And so we can look at uh, vision as such as, as, a, as, a, as an inference problem, wherein uh, you have things that are in the physical world and then you have something that's creating an image onto this uh, uh, that you're thinking is, is, is two dimensional and your model is essentially trying to explain this particular image. That's the, uh, that's the problem that you're trying to do. Um, and, and, and so there are uh, many physical things out in the world and your model is essentially trying to uh, capture the dynamics of those physical things uh, in some elegant way. And there are, uh, we described a few different models before uh, and we'll, we'll just stay, dr drill through one more and that might actually uh, give you some uh, concrete results that you can look at. Uh, so this idea is of efficient coding. We discussed this a little before, which is to use uh, uh, all, all the codes efficiently. Does everyone in your you know, population of neurons are actually doing something uh, uh, to contribute to the problem? Uh, and uh, there is, uh, you don't want everyone to be doing the same thing. You want them to be doing somewhat different or dissimilar things so that there's a better capture of the problem. And that uh, whatever each neuron is doing is somewhat independent of the other. Um, and with that, so this is, this is a certain kind of model. It's called sparse coding. It's uh, something that my, my advisor uh, pushed through in his postdoctoral work, uh, which essentially talks about uh, just two things that you want to reconstruct an image uh, from input features and you want these uh, neurons to be somewhat sparse. Uh, and, and that's really all you're trying to do uh, when you're trying to build these models. So you can look at it again here. The thing, the blue is just saying like, I want to create, I want to explain the world. Uh, and I want to do it with as few, and, and the part of the red is essentially saying, I want to do it as few neurons as possible. Uh, and, and this creates a, a representation like this. Uh, and so these are visual fields. In, uh, in, in V1 in, 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 uh, and macaque and cat. Uh, so sorry, this is actually the output of, of a computational model. And why this is uh, important or exciting is that these uh, response fields um, in some work from the 90s essentially show that they are very similar to how macaques visual representations look. Uh, so kind of suggesting that this is the computation that's actually happening in, in, in the visual cortex, right? That you're able to write a model uh, take images and then describe something. And when you show the same set of images to a biological system, and then you compute the visual response from that, you're seeing something very similar. And, and so, so that, that was some, actually a really beautiful piece of work. Uh, and, and it really is something that has gone, gone forward and repeated itself in other sensory modalities. You see sparsity in, in auditory cortices, you see sparsity um, in, in, um, in, in almost every other way and fashion that you can think about. Uh, and across different, uh, you know, animal uh, systems. Uh, but this was just explaining one, one aspect of the variance. Uh, as you know, we don't see static images. We see like dynamic images. So you want to capture things like form and motion. So people started extending this. And then you see models uh, such as uh, like the ones here, where you're on the first level, you're seeing just like, uh, you know, uh, visual receptive fields that seem similar to the ones before. And the second one, you're seeing things that are, capturing things like rotation and translations and, and capturing maybe higher level statistics of the problem. And so that's, that's really a certain way of like modeling uh, uh, representations in the brain. Uh, we talked about this, but we, we haven't used any notion of supervision. Uh, and, and this is, uh, as we alluded to earlier in the talk, uh, visual representations are important only as much as the kind of activity it helps us do. And so, uh, so if you're thinking about activity, then we can step in a little bit. Uh, we can think of activity as, as a goal or a specific task or some having some teacher signal with which we can actually uh, uh, perform a specific goal uh, out in the world. And uh, so, so more recently, the kind of computation models you see uh, are things called deep learning. Um, and, and, and if you've not heard of this, uh, this is all the rage in, in, uh, since 20, uh, 2012 was the first paper, but since 2015, it's just been completely uh, 
uh, it's just changed the face of like how machine learning and AI have, uh, have been uh, doing things out in the world. Uh, so here the models are very, uh, they're, they're, they have less explainability. Uh, they have very uh, fixed repeatable components and they scale really, really uh, well. They're, but the, the number of parameters in these models are just massive. You're talking about millions and billions of parameters, but you see like amazing outcomes, uh, like uh, uh, examples like this, wherein you can detect dogs and cats and things like that, uh, almost at human level uh, perception, which is, uh, which is pretty uh, incredible. At least if you want to classify uh, different objects, that aspect of uh, perception is actually now very well modeled by these, uh, these classes of models. And more recently, uh, uh, what you're seeing is the same set of models are being applied to things like uh, your, your, your self-driving Tesla cars or um, having your robots actually be able to lift and pick and place objects. Some of this I worked on during my PhD and, and we won't talk about any of that today. Uh, so so uh, I, with that, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna stop uh, things about the theory part. Uh, I, I just wanted to give you a flavor of how um, people think about theory and computation in the brain. Um, but th this by no means means that uh, things are, uh, you know, well understood or finished. So I just wanted to present a few examples of things that are, uh, that excite me, that uh, are things that are probably unknown. And then I'll, I'll end with that and then we can have some questions or, or discussions. Uh, so, so one idea is that the, the, the talk that we, uh, that presented, uh, was presented today, largely, uh, uh, if you look at the earlier parts of the theory, is is just modeling what is the ventral, what is known as the ventral stream. Uh, so there, there's been some uh, amazing work uh, by by folks, especially Goodale, uh, which talks about the two stream hypotheses. Uh, so you essentially have a ventral stream and a dorsal stream, and and the, uh, what uh, is often loosely referred to as the where and the what stream. Uh, so the what stream is essentially the ventral stream, and the where stream is like uh, where exactly is, are things in the world. And why is this important or interesting? Um, well, uh, if you want to perform actions in the world, you care about a more Euclidean representation, wherein something that you can interact, I can pick up this watch or this coin or this pen, uh, you need to know where things are in the world. While the watch is just telling you, you know, uh, identifying objects and things in the scene. Uh, and, and an effective representation combines both of these really well. And, and so far, uh, theories, stitching both of this uh, are, are somewhat lacking. We don't really have a good sense of like how something can be both uh, explaining things in the ventral stream and the dorsal stream simultaneously and how do we build models of that. Uh, and the challenge for that is like, I think it takes full circle. You need to know what the task is. You need to know what the kind of rewards are uh, and then figure out how, uh, how we can go about like branching out in, in the computation. Um, the other thing that uh, is, is super exciting is like, how do you make a cohesive representation from multiple sensory inputs? Uh, I don't know if you've seen this before, but the sense of touch is like extremely critical to perform actions. And this is a, a large part of what I worked on uh, during the latter part of my PhD is uh, how do you have touch uh, and, and build models? So here they're trying to light a uh, match. Uh, uh, in the previous case, it was just like regular. Now they're getting anesthetized. Um, So it took a little, lot longer, but what's important to, to note is also like the way the, the, the representations adapt. You go from a, a fine grasp to a power grasp, and then you're still able to continue to, uh, you know, perform the task. And this is incredibly fascinating because we don't have uh, computational models that are that robust to disruption of systems. Uh, we, uh, it's, it's just incredibly fascinating how, how, how robust biology is when you're thinking about these things. And, uh, and also how you're integrating, I, I think if you're, you know, if you're um, uh, sort of uh, the fact that you're using your visual input 
uh, along with your tactile sensation and, and your previous memory of how things work uh, to get a particular outcome is just really, really fascinating. Um, and then the last part, uh, and I'll leave with this, uh, end the talk with this, is how much plasticity exists in sensory motor representations. Uh, this is an experiment that was done in, in, in 1963 by Hein and Held, and, and uh, it's also uh, commonly referred to as the kitten carousel experiments. So they had two sets of kittens, uh, and, and I'll just explain this briefly. Uh, one set of kittens that could free explore the world, another set of kittens that were in this carousel with like a, uh, you know, some uh, sort of a projector screen where they could see a specific, uh, um, you know, scenery that they, they that the experimenters wanted the kitten to see. And after about a, a week or so, uh, they left both the kittens to uh, sort of explore the world, and they had something called a, a cliff, right, a, a visual cliff. So it's essentially, um, you can think of like a, a two, two, uh, a large gap between uh, uh, two tables uh, with a with a maybe like a few feet uh, fall off. So it's not, not necessarily dangerous. Uh, and then they put a glass plane over uh, the two particular uh, tables. So now the kitten that, was, that got to free explore came to the edge. And even though there's a glass plane uh, connecting these two, uh, you know, um, tables, uh, the kitten paused. And the kitten that was in the carousel just like kind of waltz through the particular uh, uh, plane. Uh, this is sort of suggesting that uh, how much plasticity that exists uh, while 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 learning or during the development phase of uh, an, uh, a being is just very very uh, helpful to make informed actions later. And uh, this is fixable. So I think uh, they put the kitten back. Uh, and, and got it to free explore and within like about a week or so they could, uh, you know, do the same, same task fairly effectively. So there's a lot of notion of plasticity that exists in the brain and, uh, and some of it is like pre-baked and some of it is like you can learn and it might be interesting to see how maybe with, uh, at least with the prism experiments, you could imagine doing something like having people, uh, who, uh, meditate, see if they can actually adapt and learn much more uh, faster with, uh, with, with, with like significant disruption to your uh, inputs. Uh, okay, with that, I'm gonna end. Um, uh, I'm, I'm <clears throat> thank you for your attention. Uh, I, find, I find biology incredibly fascinating and computation just as much and, and, and hopefully you do too. And if this is, uh, with that, I'll, I'll pause and maybe I can take a few questions and otherwise you know, we can enjoy the rest of your uh, day. Mayur, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I think we have little time for questions, but um, I have a million questions, but you know, I'll just ask you one. Uh, one of the things that, um, of course, we share a common uh, spiritual master. So he talks about is, you know, how the vision, like when you are in the moment and when you are not in the moment, how you're, let's say that I see Mayur and I've seen Mayur a minute ago and how that previous image is basically the memory with which I'm functioning right now. You know, I may not be really seeing you right now. Mm -hmm. So how does that happen? What is the basis of that? Uh, is that plasticity? Is there a great segue there? Or? So actually, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, it, it goes back to one of the recurrent theme in the whole talk, which is that uh, you don't really see what's out there. You, 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 you're, you know, and, and uh, if you look at uh, some of the 3D uh, perception that we were talking about, you do not have enough uh, information. You do not have enough information to actually uh, uh, get that particular percept. So the reason you're getting that percept is you're projecting uh, past memories onto your current experience of the situation to see what you are. This is literally what the Bayesian part that I was trying to explain is that there's just so much uh, memory that that needs to get projected for you to see things the way that you do. Uh, and and how can you distance uh, how, or rather how do you how do you manipulate that memory better? Wherein it is not that you're losing that memory, but it is it is not uh, coloring your perception as much. Is 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 literally where I see the intersection of between what uh, um, meditation as a tool offers and uh, perception as we think about it right now. So the current uh, dominant theme is that there's only one way to exist. That there is no way to like manipulate that memory. That memory is always going to dominate you. And I think what my uh, understanding of meditation is that that's not the case. You can actually get a little bit of distance from the memory. You can turn it on when you need it, but you can also turn it off in some way. Uh, and it's, it's more like a knob that you get to control a little bit. And, and that's maybe where the plasticity is. 
and and uh, yeah, it, it's it's incredibly fascinating to look at. Is it, it one of the okay. reasons why you know uh, one is because we have this visual cortex or the visual input for the sensory system is the largest sensory input to the brain and uh, something like sixty percent and and this is one of the reasons why we close our eyes when we meditate, at least starting to meditate. And then learn That's something at the very end where you keep your eyes open and then do the Samima practices. That's that's very interesting. Um, that's a hard question to answer. That's that, but that, uh, I I would think it comes. You, you're definitely right that the visual input is the most dominant. Uh, it is it is it, it it does occupy a good chunk of your cortex. Uh, but I also think there is something to do with how. The prefrontal cortex in, in, integrates with the visual uh, system in in your percept of the uh, of, of the world, um, and uh, I, I would think like experiments that are uh, dealing with um, um, learning or plasticity and attention uh, with, with 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 visual perception are is something that I think there's there's a lot of room to explore there and see like what. Um, you know, the, the low hanging fruits would be like how much wriggle room you have uh, in that, like, maybe you just get better attention, maybe you get better uh, plasticity or in terms of learning a completely new task. Like if you set two groups of populations uh, to do the same thing, uh, to perceive something new, um, uh, then, then you'd expect like, you know, meditators and non-meditators to perform a little differently. But you can take that to the extreme situa situation. You could take, say, maybe, you know, monks in the ashram or people who've been doing this for a for a very long time, where they can really move into a state where uh, mm -hmm. their perception is like completely uh, untainted by memory, and then I think you can you can try even more complicated experiments there. Uh, I, I I find that fascinating, but I, uh, I I don't think I have a clear answer to um, is that the reason why we close our eyes to meditate? Right, I will um, I'll stop. I mean, maybe if somebody else has a question, I have, we have a uh, Kestis. I think he's also visual neuros perception scientist so maybe he has something to comment um or others if you have any questions to my group if no one has then i will <laughs> hey hi mayur um hey Kestis. so some of what you talked about uh at the end is called top-down facilitation from the prefrontal cortex we actually mm -hmm. have a few papers in 2007 and later that speak to that. So basically, there's a, sort of a feedback of based on course perception that's activated and the memories are fed back to the ventral stream and facilitate perception. And that's why we're able to resolve these ambiguous images mm -hmm. that you talked about. Yeah, as far as the, um, the why, why uh, meditators close their eyes. I think it's to suppress this feedback, probably. But I mean, I don't know for sure. Um, uh, but as we know, when you close your eyes, alpha goes up, disrupts uh, a lot of the, a lot of the processing um, that would normally take place. So um, maybe that's. I mean, who knows? I don't know. If any mm -hmm. anybody has an answer about this? Yeah, another thing that you said was um, the how the jellyfish acts and how the um, you know the jumping spider. The jumping spider has eyes, right? As clearly defined mm -hmm. eyes. The jellyfish does not have a clearly defined eyes. They have just visual receptors. Yeah, visual receptors. So um, this may be a stupid question, but you know, as we uh, go on the evolution, right? The the first sensory system to develop is vision, and then the auditory, or is it the other way? Uh, not necessarily true, uh, one way or the other. There are systems that don't have sophisticated vision. If you look at uh, more reptilian systems, they're, they're not really, you know, enhanced. Even, even not sophisticated, right? Even just the first, for example, uh, if Touch you look at It's actually the most important one. Right, right. Uh, above the brain stem, you have the occipital cortex. So it seems to me yeah. that that came right after once you brainstem is all about your control of breathing and uh, heart rates, et cetera. Correct. Right above that, you have occipital cortex, which probably developed before the auditory or 
because auditory is in the temp, you know, below uh, in the temporal region. So I'm not sure um, how this works. That's, that's a good question. Idea. So if I may, if I may sort of interject. So the first vision that develops is brainstem, brainstem based, uh, superior colloquialis based. Uh, mm -hmm. This is sort of action vision and very poor resolution. Mm -hmm. But we think, at least in uh, the, some of the stuff that we've done uh, recently, is that the third pathway, so there are two pathways uh, that um, you were talked about, uh, or two major streams, right? The, 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 the ventral and the dorsal, and two major pathways, uh, the magnus cell and the power cell that are feed into those streams, though not exclusively. But there's a third pathway uh, called the coniocellular pathway, which codes uh, for blue violet light and has other functions, which also include integrating audio, auditory and visual, and even tactile information. So conio cells integrate several mm. of the senses, it seems, although this is very new and, and sort of not very well explored, but mm. it's something that definitely seems to be happening. Um, so even in the visual, uh, so in blind people, the visual cortex gets, uh, reformulated to, to do auditory perception or tactile perception. That's been shown. Um, but, so but the visual, visual cortex actually is active even for folks who are blind. Uh, there's, yeah. there's a lot of work that uh, suggests that, but uh, one, one, of the, one of the things that I, uh, it was sort of an epiphany for me, and maybe, maybe others have had this before, but it was just that the, the sense of uh, touch or the tactile sensing is actually something that's that's shared by all of biology. You may or may not have visual systems. You may or may not have uh, uh, as sophisticated auditory systems uh, or even your sense of, sense of smell, but the sense of touch is actually the thing that unites all of biology. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. Uh, without that, you don't know where you end and where the world starts and how you can manipulate the world. And this to me was actually uh, somewhat profound uh, in that like, it's only your sense of touch that tells you like where uh, where you end and where you don't, uh, and it might sound somewhat, you know, oh, you know, seemingly deep, but not. But I think it is actually a very profound idea, because uh, when you know that the body that you have is not uh, fixed, it's it's actually a transaction. Then and and the sense of touch is the only thing that defines where you end and or where your body ends and where the world starts, uh, and if that's uh, a fluid system, then it's really profound uh, where 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 your where your where your uh, world as such ends, um, and and where the other parts begin. Uh, and so, learning to integrate that into every sensory system is something that's somewhat very poorly understood. Like how uh, how tactile sensing uh, really connects. So people have models, but uh, when I when I say a, a, a framework, it's just that if I if I you know, plug in that framework, like the way some of the uh, frameworks I've talked about, then you should just end up learning what's required for a particular task. And that's uh, that's still somewhat decided, undecided. Very great. Um, if there are no questions. I need to jump on another meeting. Uh, were you going to say something, Kestris? Yeah, so Mayur, you might find, uh, so if you like this stuff a lot, it seems, and I do too, there's a great book called Sensory Exotica written by maybe 15 years ago by my uh, uh, PhD mentor, actually. Uh, it's about the different exotic bi biological systems in different animals. I want to look it up. Awesome. Yeah. I would. Uh, Great. Mayur, thank you so much once again and uh, have a nice evening. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone.